<clears throat> Great. Thank you, Hunter. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I tend to be soft-spoken, so just yell if you can't hear me. Uh, what I want to cover today is to talk a little, a little bit about aging skin and then help you appreciate the difference between aging skin and photoaging skin, which are two different entities. Um, I think a real important thing as you're dealing with an aging population is they are prone to grow bumps, and bumps can be benign or bumps can be malignant, and so helping differentiate those or at least knowing when to refer them uh, can be very helpful in the clinic. And then we'll talk about some of the common things that we see in an aging population associated with their uh, process of aging. Uh, why is it important? Well, we're all getting older, you know, and we're all um, going to be taking care of people who are getting older as the baby boomers gray out. Uh, there are just some statistics I threw out there, but, uh, you know, the bottom line of all the stats is that uh, America is getting a little bit older, and so we need to uh, better understand how to take care of them. Uh, and, and I hate to be real pathophysiologic or anatomic on you, but I think it's helpful just to review kind of how the skin is made up. You've got the dead outer layer, which is the stratum corneum. You've got the epidermis, which is a viable layer of keratinocytes that in this very organized manner give rise to the stratum corneum. You have the support structure of the dermis, the tough collagen underneath, has all the blood vessels and nerves running up. And then you have the, I call it subcutaneous layer. It's actually subcutaneous fat, but layer sounds better. Um, and that increases with age. And then you have a whole bunch of appendageal structures from hair to nails, a whole bunch of glands, eccrine, sebaceous, African glands. And then the other actors in this play are the immigrant cells. And, and these are cells that are not of true ectodermal origin but that migrate into the epidermis and spend the rest of their life there uh, in the epidermis. And we'll talk a little bit about those. And this is just a graphic of the same thing. So this is the basal layer. This is where all the cells divide. Many uh, commit to being cells that continue to divide. Others, though, commit to being cells that go on up to form the stratum corneum. And so they begin to slowly die, extrude the nucleus, and form this sort of cement substance that gives you this brick and mortar configuration to the stratum corneum. Again, stratum corneum, epidermis, dermis with these dermal papillae sort of increasing the interface between the epidermis and the dermis. Uh, then you have all the support structures, the hair, eccrine gland, or nerves, eccrine glands down here, sebaceous glands, a bunch of blood vessels, all that sort of courses through the dermis. Um, just another image of the blood vessels and the dermal papillae, those are called. And then uh, one big important actor is a melanocyte, and these are the cells that give pigment to the skin. And so they, they basically produce little pigment granules called melanosomes and feed those to the keratinocytes, creating the different skin colors we know. So that the um, darker skin types don't necessarily have more melanocytes, but they have melanocytes that produce more mature melanosomes giving a darker color to the skin and also giving more photo protection to the skin because of that. So what happens with aging? Well, that, that um, dermal papillae kind of flattens out, um, so there's less interface between the dermis and the epidermis. The epidermis becomes variably thick. The cells get a little irregular, varying in size and shape. You may get a little nuclear atypia. Uh, fewer melanocytes, the number of melanocytes decreases, although they can kind of aggregate together into uh, pigmented spots on the skin. And then also there are fewer Langerhans cells. And these are the ones that process antigens that come into the skin. The dermis gets thinner, there are fewer fibroblasts, fewer mast cells, capillary loops shorten, the, abnor or the nerve endings become abnormal. Uh, thank you very much. Depigmented hairs and loss of hair, two things I'm aware of. Um, there's a conversion of terminal hair, terminal hair to vellus hair, abnormal nail plates. Nails can actually thicken as you get older, and so a lot of times you'll see older individuals who have what looks like onychomycosis, but it's just this onychogryphosis where they have thickened hyperkeratotic nails. Uh, then they tend to have fewer glands, so they don't perspire as much, and their skin may not be as oily and may be more prone <coughs> to dry out. So, you know, all, all those sort of cellular and, and, and um, uh, changes lead to really functional changes. So the, the skin is not as, as good at replacing itself. There's an impaired barrier function as we all grow older. Uh, they don't tend to clear stuff out of their skin, so if they get 
any kind of chemical or contactant on their skin, it may be more of a problem. They don't feel things as well. They uh, lose mechanical perfection, the protection, the wounds don't heal as well. Their immune system's compromised. Because the blood vessels have changed, they don't thermoregulate as well. They can't sweat as well, plan into that one. Again, don't produce sebum. Uh, vitamin D and DNA repair are both compromised. So there are these functional changes that can lead to problems in an aging population with the skin. Now, we talked about dif differentiating aging skin from photoaging skin, and most of what I lift listed is just aging skin. And this is a good clinical representation. This was a farmer down in Alabama who, uh, I, I admire farmers that work extremely hard and usually don't have time to go to the beach and vacation. So this guy never took his shirt off, and yet he was out in the sun all the time. And so what you see is 80-year-old photoprotected skin and 80-year-old sun-damaged skin. And, and that difference is, is what photoaging is all about. Uh, and, and there have been you know, some studies that have clarified what it actually is, and there are changes in the elastic tissue, and um, cells or blood vessels weaken, so they tend to bleed more into the skin. Sebaceous glands can overgrow. I, I won't bother reading that whole list, but just realize there are different kinds of changes that can happen in photoaging. And that has a clinical correlate. The skin tends to dry out. They have irregular pigmentation, wrinkling, inelasticity, broken blood vessels, telangiectasias, venous lake, and purpura. So that they, they talk about the look of aging, uh, but a lot of the look of aging is actually the look of photoaging. So most of this, these changes are really changes related to chronic sun exposure and not just to him being 80 years old. Uh, a lot of if you take care of older individuals are very aware of this actinic purpura. It used to be called senile purpura, but that became kind of uh, politically incorrect to call it senile purpura. And, and not accurate, because it is more a sun-induced problem, so actinic purpura. And, and this is just kind of part of it, because the other part is they'll complain about their skin just kind of ripping off any time they hit a doorway, because the epidermis becomes so thin, and they've lost that support of the collagen underneath. <laughs> Uh, hard to appreciate, this is a young woman's chest, but you can, you can see some early changes in the V of her neck there. A lot of telangiectasia, what we call poikiloderma of savat, uh, and, and she's got significant changes there that are going to get worse over time unless she does something about it. So how do you treat photoaging? Well, prevent it. I mean, that's the number one thing. Um, you know, and, and so we talk about sunscreen, shade, and clothing are the big three ways to prevent it. Um, there are creams out there. You know, we have some folks we give retinoids to. Tretinoin, the most common, adapalene. Cosmetic industry is plugged into it, so they're putting retinol in all their moisturizers, and those can be helpful. Um, alpha hydroxy acid may be helpful. There are physical treatments, lasers, chemical peels, all those things can be helpful in terms of treating the sun damaged skin. But if you're going to invest in all that, I like to make sure my patients understand, then you want to, on the back end, protect it. Wear your sunscreens, get back in the shade, and wear appropriate clothing to protect the investment you made on, on uh, keeping your skin from being so sun damaged. And, and just to, you know, I mean, uh, there are a million ways to get people to spend their money in dermatology, and there are a lot of different peels. You can do superficial, medium, deep peels many different lasers that can be used from ablative to non-ablative and in between to minimally ablative. Uh, intense pulse light, which is just broader spectrum, not really a, a focused wavelength like a laser is. So why are older folks more prone to skin disease? Well, we talked about the changes in the structure and function of their skin. Uh, cumulative environmental insults, and, and here in our world, probably ultraviolet radiation is the most common and best example of that. So too much sun over too long a period of time. Age-related illness in other organ systems, and I'll show you a few pictures of that. Uh, change in the environment. They may, you know, retire from Minnesota down to Florida and be exposed to a whole new set of environmental issues from plants and animals to sunlight to heat uh, that can give them problems. Uh, probably more sadly towards the end here is the social circumstances, their spouse dies, um, playing into them getting depressed or getting demented as they grow older. And then just some functional things of increasing physical frailty. Uh, you know, our, probably one of our biggest battles, and we'll talk about stasis dermatitis, but there are a lot of folks who need stasis term, or need treatment for stasis dermatitis. But getting them to be able to get their support hose on is very difficult because they can't get into their feet and they can't get the 
really tough uh, support hose open to get them on because they just have gotten too frail with age. So those kinds of things sort of impact some of the decisions we uh, make in clinic. So here's an example of an underlying illness, a lady with CLL who, who developed this diffuse vesicular eruption all over her face and all over her body really. We're just seeing her face here. And then what she had was a disseminated zoster secondary to her being immunocompromised from her chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This was an older fella who um, had some mild dementia, prostate cancer, congestive heart failure, hypertension, and had this chronic staphylococcal rash on his face called lupoid psychosis. And uh, you see it in, in individuals, you don't see it often, but you see it in individuals who can't uh, take care of themselves. They can't bathe regularly. And he was living alone and bathing once a week and always came in smelling of urine and, you know, just sort of a whole host of sort of social and aging issues that were contributing to his skin problems. This was a lady who had advanced, five years ago, had advanced Alzheimer's disease and she had been found to have guaiac positive stools, but because of her advanced Alzheimer's disease, they decided not to work it up in, in talking to the family. And it was probably a good decision, but then she presented with metastatic colon cancer on her skin. Um, went back in and, and did a very minimum on her and she had a big apple coral lesion in her transverse colon and died within six months. I uh, don't see this much anymore, but a lady who had had um, a, a breast cancer and had a radical mastectomy back when they were more aggressive with surgery and developed an angiosarcoma, something called Stuart Treve syndrome, in her chronic lymphedematous limb where she had had the mastectomy. This is always a cool rash. Uh, you know, it kind of looks like tinea, but it's called the erythema gyratum repens, and it falls into the category a perineoplastic syndrome. So this is somebody who probably has an upper aerodigestive squamous cell carcinoma that presented with this perineoplastic syndrome we recognize as erythema gyratum repens. So, so those are just some examples of where their underlying um, medical problems may contribute to their cutaneous problems as well. But, but let's talk a little bit about in the clinic and more common things. And, and probably the most common problem aging individuals are going to have is going to be their skin drying out. And, uh, you know, this is a good example of somebody who just has lost the barrier function of the skin. They've lost the ability to retain moisture in their skin, and so it dries out and it gets, it, well, it can get very itchy. It certainly gets flaky. Uh, wintertime tends to be a much uh, bigger a time when this is a much bigger problem because the relative humidity drops, artificial heating takes more humidity out of the air, and so their skin is even more prone to dry out. So we're seeing quite a bit of this now in our clinic. And I always tell people dry skin is not in and of itself a problem, but it can be itchy. It can lead to numular eczema. It can kind of cause other problems. And so if they want to try to either prevent a problem or if they have a problem and want to treat it more aggressively, really aggressively managing the dry skin uh, can be helpful. And, and sometimes the skin will just get so dry, it's like a dried riverbed where the mud sort of cracks and that's called erythema cracklay. And then it gets real inflamed and irritated where the micro fissures are. And um, you can see here just sort of where all these little lines where the skin has gotten a little micro fissure and gotten very inflamed. They say all you need to do is treat the dry skin uh, to help manage this, but w whenever I see red, I pull out my prescription pad for triamcinolone. Uh, and here, if you're going to give them a topical steroid, give it to them in an ointment form because the ointment's going to be a much better moisturizer. It's like Vaseline as opposed to the vanishing cream that, that wouldn't be quite as good a moisturizer. And it can progress to this, little patches of numular eczema on a background of dry skin, and, and these can be intensely itchy, you know. So here, clearly addressing these with some uh, topical steroids in an ointment base, and then aggressively managing the dry skin would be the, uh, the way to approach them. Well, how do you treat the dry skin? Well, the, uh, I learned back in Alabama <laughs> that the way to clean a greasy skillet is with hot soap and water. And so if you use that same hot soap and water on someone's skin, they're going to take out the natural oils in their skin, the grease in their skin, 
and let it dry out. And explaining that to somebody in Alabama, they can understand that. You know, they're used to the the uh, grease in the skillet. So turning down the water temperature. Now, don't make them take cold showers, but just you know, if they like the billows of steam coming out of the shower, they need to cut back on that to where it's more a tepid shower. Uh, minimize the use of hard, harsh soap. So in, in general, using a soap that contains a moisturizer is a good guideline. Dove, Tone, Caress, Oil of Olay, all those uh, have a moisturizer in them. And the other thing I'd like to point out to them, because a lot of the dry skin you'll see will be like on the legs. And if they're doing routine bathing, all they need to do is use the soap in areas where skin comes against skin. So up under the arms, under the breasts, in the groin. Uh, feet maybe will count as that because the shoes can be another form of skin. Uh, but those are the areas where bacteria tend to grow and where odor tends to come from. And they don't need to rub it on their arms. They don't need to rub it up and down their legs unless they've been out, you know, rolling in the mud or doing yard work or something where they, they feel they need to use the soap to clean that up. Then usually we recommend they just pat their skin dry, try to leave a little moisture on the skin, and then trap that moisture in with a good moisturizer. <coughs> Which is the best? Well, that's what they always ask. And I always tell them, well, the best is the one that you're going to use. You know, we can tell people to use Crisco, and Crisco is a great moisturizer, but there are a lot of people who are going to not like the idea of putting Crisco on their skin. So we tend to like to set them up with samples, two or three samples that they can try and see which one they like the feel of better. Because there is a lot of cosmesis that goes into these uh, moisturizers, and you want to make sure you can maximize compliance by having it be something that they don't mind having put on their skin. With kids, a lot of times that they're bathing, we'll, we will recommend putting oil in the bath water. In an aging population, you worry about broken hips and things like that. So. You know, if you've done everything else and they tend to bathe and not shower, you can add that, but I always make sure that the patient understands it's going to make the tub a little bit more slippery, and so be very careful. Alluded to stasis dermatitis. I think the figures are that about 20% of the population at some point will have trouble with stasis dermatitis. Uh, you know, we, we sort of know whenever we get a consult for bilateral lower extremity cellulitis that it's going to be stasis dermatitis because it's so common, usually involves both lower extremities, uh, tends to be chronic. Uh, you can see the supportive sort of the erythema, the brawny color of the skin there, the ectatic blood vessels, uh, you know, and if you push on it, it pits and stays pitted. And all that just shows you it's stasis dermatitis. And um, edema itself isn't a problem. It can be a problem. It can lead to the dermatitis, the inflammation, which you can use topical steroids and support. But the, the bigger issue is when it starts to break down and you get a stasis ulcer. And these are just harder to heal. And we must have ooh, maybe 10 patients coming in now weekly getting unibus to their stasis ulcers trying to heal those up. So how do you treat stasis dermatitis? Well, support, support, support. And I mentioned this earlier, that this unfortunately is a group that's getting older, they're getting more frail. You give them these really stretchy support hose to put on. They haven't touched their toes in 20 years, and you're asking them to go down there and put those things on their feet and pull them all the way up their leg. It's a real battle for some of these older folks who have arthritis or just are getting older and weaker. Um, so you do what you can, but just realize it's going to be a problem. If it's itching, you can use triamcinolone, something to help with the itching component of it. If there are underlying diseases, congestive heart failure, uh, liver disease, renal disease, contributing to any edema, however one can control that can help with the edema and help with the overall problem. If they have an ulcer, you want to make sure that their hemoglobin's up, make sure that their nutrition's adequate, and then make sure they have the support, either through support hose or unibus, to heal up that ulcer. Um, real frustrating problem in an aging population. Um, you know, we see a lot of eczema in kids, but there's a second subset, probably because they've lost the barrier function, they, they, their longer Han cells are going somewhere else and they don't clear things from their skin quite as well. They, they tend to get more irritant kind of dermatitis. They look like late onset adult atopics. And uh, the, the problem here is, is 
treatment's a challenge because they, they can't get their hands everywhere where they need to put the cream. And if you want to consider prednisone or other systemic medications, so many of them will have diabetes or heart disease or high blood pressure or something else that will make prednisone less desirable. So it gets to be a challenge sometimes um, knowing how to manage these people. Sometimes it can be easy. Uh, I, I have a theory that older individuals listen more to the pharmacist than they do to the doctor. You know, so they, they, they may grab the Neosporin that the pharmacist recommends and, and start putting that on something on their skin and break out in a contact dermatitis from the Neosporin or topical Benadryl or some of these other products that people can react to. So th there it's a little bit easier. I'm sorry, was there a question? Hearing voices, all right. So, you know, we, we search for an allergen, so we try to ask them about Neosporin or topical Benadryl, but a lot of times you can't find anything in one of these older onset um, eczema patients. Uh, we usually will see dry skin with it, so trying to aggressively manage that dry skin. Avoiding irritants, I think just in general, making sure they know that anything that smells good shouldn't be on their skin. And that's a little frustrating, but um, they need to buy products that say hypoallergenic, force sensitive skin, fragrance free, and you know, all those buzzwords that tell them there's not a whole lot else in this product. Because any chemical potentially could be the thing that's irritating their skin. Um, managing with topical steroids, uh, and, and we like Triamcinolone because it's a good mid potency generic steroid. I think it's still inexpensive. I haven't checked that one recently, but everything seems to be going up. But the other advantage is you can get it in a big one pound tub. You know, and it's always funny to us. We see these folks with bad dermatitis in the hospital, recommend triamcinolone and they bring them a 15 gram tube. Well, a, a 60 gram tube will pretty much cover the average 70 kilogram man from head to toe one time. So a 15 gram tube is really almost nothing. And so if they have widespread eczema, getting them a big one pound tub of it is, is what they're gonna need. We tend to lean a lot on antihistamines, especially if they're having trouble sleeping at night, with the one caveat that in an older individual, you may want to think about uh, lower doses and, and even using the pediatric syrup to dose their uh, hydroxazine or periactin, whatever you want to use. Uh, because the, uh, they're getting up frequently to use the bathroom, and if they're real drowsy and they trip and fall and break a hip, it's a bad trade off from itchy skin to a broken hip. So. Um, love prednisone, uh, you know, it takes care of a lot of skin problems. Unfortunately, it has all the side effects that we worry about. And, and I mentioned earlier that some of these older individuals have other medical problems concurrently, like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, uh, the list goes on, that, that make prednisone a little bit more difficult to use. So, you know, we'll, we'll sometimes use it to, to bridge them until they can start using the triamcinolone and get it on board to be... Um, to be helpful. And then there are other topical immunomodulators, Protopic and Elodil, that, that the pediatricians are aware of. I don't use these a whole lot, and I don't really find a whole lot of use in an aging population. And you always have to fill out extra paperwork every time you write it. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons not to use it. Um, but just sort of realize it is out there if your back's to the wall and you want to try something different. Or, or some people have sort of a, a steroid phobia. You know, they just they think hydrocortisone is going to just make their bones melt away, and so they don't want to use it. And you know, so you can you can go to Protopic or Elodel in that situation. And alluded to this earlier, but just be careful with some of the over-counter products that older people may be prone to use. Neomycin's uh, probably the most common one we see and, and the data out there in stasis dermatitis about 10% of people who use neomycin will manifest an allergic reaction to it so it can be a real bad actor. Topical Benadryl, they may do fine taking it orally but if they rub it on their skin it can break them out. Benzocaine and the other one uh, sunscreens and this is more of a photo contact where they they put it on go out and the um, sunscreen absorbs the ultraviolet radiation or the energy from the ultraviolet radiation and then becomes immunogenic causing allergic reaction. And we talked about these earlier fragrances, preservatives, uh, talked about the neomycin and then there are a whole, whole host of things that can cause contact dermatitis 
We can do patch testing where the North American Contact Dermatitis Group has identified the 36 most common things that people are allergic to. So if we really suspect something's a contact dermatitis, we and their back is clear, we can put these on their back and see if they react to something. And, and it, it it's, can be helpful. It's sort of investigative. But I always tell people that, I, you know, I could go out and put a sprig of poison ivy on their back and they get a reaction to the poison ivy, but it doesn't mean the poison ivy is causing the rest of their rash. So this can be a lead, and it can give you some ideas, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that one they're reacting to is causing the problem. There's still some interpretation of the data you got to do, and does it make sense? You know, can you identify where that uh, product is coming from? Uh, are many older individuals who have acne vulgaris, but rosacea is not too uncommon, and this is the inflammatory red acne with a lot of papules and pustules, uh, often flared with certain things like spicy foods, hot liquids, alcohol. Uh, a lot of times they'll have itchy or irritated eyes that can be part of the rosacea. Uh, it's kind of a mild case of it there, but just that redness with the papules across, or the yeah, inflammatory papules across the cheeks and nose. Um, a little more uh, inflammatory case of it, some pustules there on the cheeks. And, and this is what everybody sort of lives in fear of with rosacea is that rhinophyma, that WC Fields nose that, that they hope to be able to avoid. Uh, and actually, there there's some very nice surgical procedures. If you get into plastic surgery, they, they really uh, can have a very nice cosmetic outcome if it's real disfiguring. But there's nothing we can do as medical dermatologists to help with the rosacea. We can treat the inflammatory component, and now we can treat, to some degree, the redness of it, but we can't really treat the glandular overgrowth. So we use a lot of oral antibiotics, uh, doxycycline, um, a little bit of minocycline, maybe some sulfa drugs. Uh, we like to try to get them onto topical antibiotics, metronidazole, the uh, metrogel, metro lotion, sodium sulfacetamide are, are things we typically uh, like to use for long term. I'm not sure I've ever used retinoids. It, it's always in the literature you can use them, but these are people who are prone to be red, and retinoids tend to be irritating. And so a lot of times it'll just make them redder, and it may not be a good trade-off. Um, but there, I have seen a few patients on Accutane for their rosacea. I identifying and avoiding precipitants, you know, if they know, if, if they're out on a business dinner and they know that drinking hot coffee makes their face flush, well, don't drink the hot coffee, drink cold water instead. And then there are the cosmetic procedures that can be used. Um, we have a good laser for zapping telangiectasia. I showed you a picture of the debriding of the rhinophimatous tissue, and, and all that can be very helpful if it's disfiguring or frustrating to the patient. Uh, try not to use topical steroids. You can, you can get caught up in this because they actually work. And, and you know maybe for the short term before a family wedding, it would be reasonable to do. But if they use them long term, they end up kind of chasing the more and more potent steroids, and it can end up just aggravating the rosacea over the long haul. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention to you, there's a newer product out, and I talked about now we can treat the redness as Merveso is a vasoconstrictor that can be used to help diminish the redness. So and we've had a few patients who have wanted to try that and don't have much feedback other than I've gotten one request for a refill, so I guess they liked it enough to get a refill. Now, scabies is not um, really a disease of older individuals, but I think one thing that can be important to understand is it can get sort of endemic in a nursing home at times, and that can be a real mess because you, you – you know, have people spreading it to other people throughout the whole nursing home. Uh, this guy, and it gets into a little topic down the road, but this guy was uh, on his way to the CAT scan to be evaluated for uh, uh, doing a total body CAT scan looking for lymphoma for his itching problem. And, of course, we always, whenever somebody itches, the first one we want to look for is a rash, see if we think the rash is causing the itching, then figure out what the rash is. So this guy didn't need a um, CT, he needed a scabies prep. And it may be a little hard to see there, but there are these little papules. Um, I'm not sure I see any curvilinear burrows there, but, but anyway, uh, there's one, well, 
had to blow it up, but you can see this sort of curvilinear burrow where the scabies, and that little black dot, and maybe the scabies, or maybe that's it there. Um, but anyway, you know, he didn't need a CAT scan. He needed the, uh, the uh, scabies prep, and he had scabies. Treatment is with uh, elamide or quell, usually one application from the <coughs> neck down. Next morning, gather everything that had been in for the previous 48 hours, launder it in hot water. If it's something big, you know, if, if grand, Grandpa lies on the couch all the time, just quarantine the couch for 48 hours. Nobody sits on it for 48 hours because the mite can't live off the skin for that long, so that would get rid of the mite. Uh, in some cases, you can use oral ivermectin, although there is some sketchy data about there may be increased mortality in using ivermectin in an aging population, so uh, I would sort of do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think it's important to treat fomites, and, and the other thing that can slip by you sometime are other itchy contacts. You, you always ask about um, people living in the house, anybody else in the house itching, and, and they'll tell you who that is, but it, it may be that cousin Johnny is coming over every afternoon after school, and he's itching also, and he may be the vector that keeps bringing it back into the household. Uh, it can be workers in a nursing home who spread it to the patients. So, and sometimes when it gets into a nursing home, you just have to treat everybody in the nursing home, and that's a much bigger deal. I think the other important thing to keep in mind if you're dealing with a patient with scabies is that once you've killed the scabies, the itching doesn't go away overnight. It takes two or three weeks for the epidermis and stratum corneum to turn over and shed off all the mites, the stool, the egg. And, um, you know, once that's happened, then they'll stop itching. And so usually making them aware of that, giving them some triamcinolone, some desinide, uh, some hydroxazine to help manage the itch while it continues to get better. The concerning thing is if it's getting better for the first week and then suddenly starts getting worse again, something happened, they got reinfested, they didn't do the treatment right, or they didn't treat the, fo the fomites right. One thing in an elderly population that can be a, a bit of a challenge is the itching without a rash. I mentioned earlier whenever we have an itchy patient, first thing we look for is a rash to see if we think that rash explains the itching they're having. And if it doesn't, it kind of falls into this. And, and typically, if it's been less than six weeks, we'll just try to manage dry skin, manage the itch, and see if this thing goes away on its own. If it doesn't, then we may do a little bit of lab work and make sure we get them back to their primary care doctor for an age-appropriate physical exam to try to identify anything that, that may be causing it. Um, not infrequently, we'll see thyroid disease. Certainly anybody in nephrology knows that most of their dialysis patients have itchy, dry skin, uh, liver disease the same way. But of course, a lot of these are the ones you worry most about, some undiagnosed malignancy, either lymphoma or visceral malignancy, uh, hemologic diseases. You can have um, itching from a drug without a drug rash. And so it's helpful to always at least talk about timing of any new medications that may have happened with the timing of the uh, itching coming on. And, and this is just a list with these being the most common uh, on the left. You know, and there's some um, captopril, clonidine, I mean there's some not uncommon medications. I guess those are less used now, but even the 1 to 5%, I mean there are quite a bit of antibiotics there, aspirin, beta blockers, niacin. So uh, all those are things to think about if you're just not making any headway. So again, you know, first visit, <clears throat> if it's fairly new onset and uh, no other worrisome things, if they haven't lost 20 pounds over the past four weeks, we, we don't really do much with them other than manage their dry skin, give them some anti-itch, sarna lotion, hydroxazine kind of things. But if they come back and they're still itching, then, then when they launch into either a little bit more of a, a dermatologic workup or refer them to their primary care doctor to have that evaluation done. Uh, so treating the underlying condition uh, goes without saying. Uh, there's a adage in, in dermatology that, that uh, cool things make itching less itchy, hot things make itching more itchy. So some of our atopic summer's a miserable time for them because the really hot weather just causes their itching to get a lot worse. 
if it's a localized itching, uh, cool compresses or a cool shower can be very helpful. Uh, topical antipyretics. Uh, sarna lotion is probably the one we use the most of. Um, antihistamines we've talked about. In general, you'd use sedating antihistamines. But again, remember the lower doses in an older population. And don't forget to make the pediatric elixir. You can even titrate down to 5 milligrams or less if you needed to. Uh, or you can consider the non-sedating ones. Um, certain modalities for certain types of itching in individuals, cholestyramine for a hepatobiliary disease and opiate antagonists have been put forth. And then we used to give uh, some itchy, light pa or itchy dialysis patients uh, ultraviolet light, which can be very helpful. And one thing I think is real hard for uh, primary care doctors to pick up on all the time is this um, rash caused by the chronic itching and scratching, like in simplex chronicus and parigo nodularis. Um, you know, here's a, a patch of sort of red skin with some accentuated skin markings and maybe some thickening and a little bit of hyperpigmentation. And that's a look of like in simplex chronicus. Um, this is an older fellow who had a little bit of dementia going on, and he would, his family told us he'd just spend all day just kind of rubbing his finger from his forehead down the side of his face. And in doing that, just induced that skin change over time where it sort of thickened up and, again, accentuated skin markings, uh, pigment irregularity. And, and that was all just him doing it to himself, probably not because it was itching, but just because he was a little demented and that was what he did. The, the other part of this is um, uh, neurotic excoriations, parigonodularis, they go by many names. But you don't see any primary lesions here. You do see some lichenification around it. But anytime you see linear things, we always preach to, to think about external things. And here it's going to be a fingernail digging at that. And it can be helpful, I think, to ask if it itches, because if it itches, you have a better chance of controlling the itching. Uh, some people itch, some people just do it out of a habit, you know, just like they bite their fingernails and then they pick at their skin. And that's an isolated lesion, just a parigonodularis where somebody just spending time digging at that spot, thinking they're getting rid of it, but what it does is thicken it up and make it more of a problem. So, um, pretty much all the same thing for itching, but one thing you can do for um, uh, some of these is to add a barrier. Uh, there's something called cordran tape. That's a tape with a steroid impregnated in the tape, and that can actually put a barrier between the fingernail and the patient's skin. This was actually a patient of Bill's, and, and they uh, put her in an Una cast, not an Una boot, I guess, and, and about a week later she was almost healed up, but just keeping her hands away from it was enough to allow that to heal up. Sebderm, uh, we'll gloss over that. The, 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 I think where this is really important is in the hospital because, you know, people are used to doing the routine bathing and they use their head and shoulders at home. They get admitted to the hospital for whatever reason. They don't have their products. They don't bathe as often. Suddenly their face and scalp are getting red and scaly. And that's just them manifesting that seborrheic dermatitis that they had. But there are uh, neurologic conditions that are more commonly associated with seborrheic dermatitis, uh, strokes, Parkinson's disease, things like that can be more associated with sebderm. This is a look of a, a young guy who probably got admitted to the hospital and just couldn't get up and bathe and didn't have his head and shoulders, so it all flared on him. Uh, I won't spend time with that. Uh, just a few photos of inner trigo. Unfortunately, I guess as we're getting older, we're getting more obese too. So wherever skin folds against skin, you can get an inner trigo. Keeping that dry, treating it with anti-inflammatories, losing weight if that's a possibility can all be helpful there. Well, one um, skin disease that is somewhat unique to older individuals is bullous pemphigoid. And this is one of these great autoimmune diseases in dermatology where they have an IgG that's attacking a component of the epidermis, and it's that hemidesmosome that's anchoring the epidermis down to the dermis. And when that gets attacked, uh, there's the hemidesmosome there, different from the desmosome that's holding the cells together. 
uh, they get a blister. So it, it forms a potential space, fills with fluid, and they get a blister. And uh, I, I think I was second. If I can guarantee you're going to see an a immunobullous skin disease, this is the one you're most likely going to see because this does tend to be more of a problem in an aging population. Our population is aging, so likely going to see more and more of it. Uh, we use prednisone, other immunosuppressants, um, tetracycline. Some of the antibiotics have anti-inflammatory properties, so we'll try to use those. And, and Again, part of the reason here is because a lot of these folks have other underlying diseases, diabetes, heart disease, yada, yada, that, that makes it harder to use some of the um, more aggressive immunosuppressives. Gloss over fungal infections. And again, not necessarily part of a, an older population, but we see it fairly commonly. This is, I mean, it's hard to recognize this tinea because it's so widespread, but if you see a sharp edge to it, Pull out a blade, do a KOH, and um, you may see the dermatophyte. And, and typically, if it's widespread, I'll use oral antifungal agents. Uh, here's an older individual with this sort of big plaque, and it may not come to mind. It's not truly clear in the middle, but it's got a sharp edge. And pulling out a blade and doing a KOH, you can find your dermatophyte. Canada, the hallmark of these are the satellite lesions you'll see around the area of erythema, typically in an intertriginous area. A lot of times they'll be diabetic, a lot of times they will have received um, antibiotics, either perioperative or just outpatient antibiotics, tipping over the Canada to be more successful in that environment. Uh, another one here, kind of hard to see, but you can see all these little satellite lesions at the edge of it extends onto the scrotum, and tinea doesn't tend to go on the scrotum, so think candida if it's getting onto the scrotum. All right, uh, I wanted to spend a little time talking about tumors. Older individuals grow bumps. I mean, they're going to get a lot of bumps, and, and the overwhelming majority of the bumps they're going to get are going to be benign. And I always make the point, I think it's more important to recognize the benign bumps, almost more so than recognizing the malignant ones. Because if you can reassure them, then you don't need to do refer them or do a biopsy on them. The most common bump we probably get referred uh, to real life melanoma are these seborrheic keratoses. And, and everybody gets them to some degree. I call them wisdom spots because as they get older, they're getting wiser and they grow these bumps. But they usually travel in groups. You know, it's rare to see one seborrheic keratoses. And, you know, these two obviously look alike, but there's a smaller one there, one developing there, maybe some there and there. And um, very benign. Uh, they can be a real nuisance and, and probably are almost an autosomal dominant problem in some individuals. If you see people have a whole bunch of them, if you ask them, do you have a family member who has a bunch of them, they usually will say, yeah, my mom or dad or my grandma, somebody had a bunch of them. You can treat them. Insurance doesn't like for you to treat them, uh, but if they're irritated, inflamed, and you document it in the chart, uh, you can get reimbursed for treating these. Here's one uh, we thought we'd discovered the first annular seborrheic keratosis, but it had been frozen in the middle, and it sort of killed the middle, but the edge kept growing, and so it was um, secondary to previous treatment. Sebaceous hyperplasia, I mentioned earlier, sebaceous glands can overgrow. Uh, the yellow-white papules with a central del. Again, look around, because a lot of times these things will travel in packs, and there's a smaller one there, there's probably one over there, maybe one there with that central del, and I think I got a picture. This is the other side of his face. He's got one there. Uh, now, you know, any number of times I've biopsied a sebaceous hyperplasia to rule out a basal cell carcinoma, because they can look very similar. Lentigo, these aggregates of melanocytes, um, typically on sun-damaged skin. Uh, again, we biopsy a lot of those because they look funny and we're worried about them being malignancy, but um, usually they are not. Cherry hemangiomas kind of run with seborrheic keratosis. You can see little sort of subtle seborrheic keratosis here and a ton of cherry hemangiomas. And again, these are benign bumps that, every, that most people get as they move through life. The other thing that can be, can be concerning is they can thrombose and they look black. And so there'll be this painful black lesion 
that they're worried might be a melanoma, and, and I biopsied a few of those myself. But if you can look at them closely, a lot of times you'll see a purple edge around the um, perimeter of the lesion. Skin tags, one of our least favorite things to see in clinic. You know, nobody likes any of these things. They all want them off, you know, and it, it, it gets to be a little challenging talking them down from that. Premalignant actinic keratoses. We spend a lot of time freezing off actinic keratoses. Uh, what percentage of these become malignancies down the road is really hard to say, but the wisdom is you'd rather get rid of them as a precancer rather than let them turn into a cancer. And so we um, freeze a bunch off. We're now doing something called PDT, photodynamic therapy, and then there's some creams that you can use. It doesn't photograph very well. Maybe you can see these little red areas, but if you feel them, it feels like little sandpapery areas on the skin. I think I've got, this is a better picture. Yeah, there, this little red area there, red with scale. You know, we'd score a little liquid nitrogen and those would blister up, come off, and uh, hopefully prevent them from developing a skin cancer. I always say you can just watch these. You know, when a, a young individual comes in, a 40-year-old comes in, they got one actinic keratosis. I don't feel compelled to necessarily treat that as long as they're aware if it's changing to call us and come in. But uh, options would be cryotherapy, um, levulinic acid. They come in, we paint their face or scalp uh, with the levulinic acid, have them sit around for a while, then we shine a blue light on them for a very proscribed amount of time. It gets irritated, sort of sunburned, and then peels off and peels off the actinic keratoses. There are creams available. The standard is 5-fluorouracil and miquimod. The new kit on the block is Picado, which is a much shorter duration treatment. It's an, a spurge that's very irritating. You put it on and it gets red and irritated and again peels off, hopefully peeling off all the actinic keratoses. Uh, the, the young individual that comes in maybe has one. I might consider trying tretinoin or, or uh, adapalene, which are retinoids and can exfoliate some and may be helpful and, and also are used to treat photo damaged skin, so there may be a byproduct there. Most common skin cancer is going to be the basal cell carcinoma, these pink, pearly papules with roll border, telangiectasia, on background sun exposed skin. Most common on the head or neck. Uh, these are the most common, but they're also the least lethal of the uh, skin cancers. You know, this one's probably been growing on this lady. This is a clavicle, been growing on the chest for five or ten years, you know, and it, it's still not going to kill her, but it's just going to keep getting bigger until it gets treated. And so at, at some point it could spread, but um, we like to get them when they're smaller. Now squamous cells tend to be a little more aggressive. It's the second most common, has a little bit higher metastatic potential than, than basal cell, but still relatively low. Certain areas of the lips, the fingers, the ears, uh, we worry about more in terms of metastatic potential. And, and this turns to the spectrum. This is a little old 90-something year old lady with a, a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So real superficial squamous cells all over that bad sun damaged skin. This lady ended up having a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, which, you know, I, I didn't pick that up as a cancer until I biopsied it. And I thought it was some sort of weird ear infection, you know, and was biopsying it for culture biopsy that nodule there and it was poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma in transit. Uh, so she ended up getting radiation therapy to try to control that. We talk about fair skinned people being more at risk, but this is a darker African American female with a non-healing ulcer on the back of her thigh. This is her buttocks up here. And uh, that ended up being a, a moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So, even though people with fair skin types get more skin cancer, darker skin types still do get skin cancer, so you do have to keep your radar up about that. This, you know, just a big Bowen's disease. None of it was invasive, but very difficult to treat because it was bumping up on her eye there. And um, boy, if we'd seen her 10 years earlier, it would have been a lot easier to treat that thing. Melanoma, now, the one that's most associated with an aging population is going to be the lentigo malignant melanoma. It follows more closely the pattern of basal cell and squamous cell, where it's more common on the head and neck. Um, 
and, and it's just a big brown irregularly pigmented area if it's starting to become more nodular you worry more about it um, because it may have become invasive at that point the most common is going to be the superficial spreading melanoma these you'll see on younger individuals um, the uh, ABCD we'll talk about that in a minute but typically on the back back of legs so less uh, the basal cell squamous cell distribution a little more intermittent intense sun exposure so they're lying out on the beach they get their, their back sunburned they get their legs sunburned those areas you have to worry more about melanoma um, asymmetry border irregularity color variegation diameter greater than six millimeters and the E used to be elevation I never liked that but evolution is pretty good if it's continuing to change continuing to grow uh, or grow irregularly that's one you're going to be more concerned about. And just a caveat, remember you can't apply these to separate keratoses. It has to be a melanocytic lesion to really use the ABCDE criteria for melanoma. And you know, all bets are off. I mean, there are a lot of other cell types. I didn't even mention the Merkel cell, which is a soft touch cell in the skin. You never hear anything about it until it becomes a malignancy and this is a very aggressive form of a cutaneous skin cancer where about half of them will metastasize um, and, and so they're a bad actor but funny looking bumps and I always tell students you know you, you want to identify things that are benign yeah this is a seborrheic keratosis and you can recognize things that you're wor really worried about being malignant but then there's this group in between that don't fit into a category and those are the ones you need to biopsy uh, because, you know, clearly this is something bad and it needs tissue to know what's going on. All right, I wasn't sure if I'd finished before nine, but I did. Any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you very much.